We welcome you into the sixth episode of season two of Full Throttle, the Presidio Group's automotive industry podcast. I'm your host, Jason Stein, Director of Multimedia and Events at Presidio. On a regular basis, Full Throttle serves as the industry's meeting point for great conversations with leaders across the automotive world. You know, to, to, to Jonathan's point, to your point, as rates go up, it, 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 it will have more people based on affordability saying, you know, this isn't this isn't the right time for me. And I'm sure that's part of the part of the influence on fixed operations that we're, we're experiencing, uh, which is a good thing, um, you know, from, from that from that perspective. Uh, so, yeah, it, uh, the, the pricing and the payments need to be tempered to bring more of the market back. Our conversation with Rob Cochran, president and CEO of Number One Cochran, comes at a pivotal time in the industry. Cochran is not only navigating the issues related to the dynamic political landscape and his role as chairman of NADA's Industry Relations Committee. At the time of our taping, he's in a dogfight with his own DMS provider, CDK. Not that the turmoil is anything new for Cochran, who has seen his share of disruptions and disruptors. Number one, Cochran is Western Pennsylvania's largest automotive retailer. Founded in 1965 as a single-point Pontiac dealership, the company today operates 28 new vehicle franchises, representing 18 domestic and imported brands. Number One Cochran also operates three standalone pre-owned stores, eight collision centers, and a wholesale parts distribution center. Today, we hear about his view of the industry from all angles, inventory to F&I, as well as the future of the vehicle fleet, and even China. We talk about the changing role of technology, the changing consumer, and his view on how dealers need to adapt and change in the future. It's Rob Cochran as my guest today on Full Throttle. Hi, this is Rob Cochran, and this is Presidio's podcast, Full Throttle. We're usually seeing each other coming on or off the stage in New York, uh, of, especially of late. But it is great to be, or at NADA, but it is great to be with my friend Rob again. Welcome into the program. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Jason. It's great to be here. Well, we can't go... Um, much further in the conversation without talking about the elephant in the room. So I, you know, this obviously um, events may overtake even this conversation, but we can have a broader conversation. Let's talk about the CDK situation. Um, Rob, you are a CDK customer. Um, I know in my, in my previous days that we, we wrote about you being on the platform. Tell me what life is like on the ground for you today. Well, it's there's certainly there's curveballs and then there's uh, curveballs like this. So it, this it certainly uh, since since last Wednesday, uh, it's now almost a week that we've been dealing with this, and, and it has been a challenge for our team. Uh, I'm proud of the way our team has responded. Uh, Thirty two rooftops with CDK uh, technology that uh, has not we've not been able to lean on it. Uh, so. We have been, um, you know, the first day or two, I'd say, was more paralysis, and then since then, um, just a lot of creative, a lot of creativity, a lot of innovation within our team, figuring out how to how to move forward and how to how to serve customers. So it is clearly not perfect. We're uh, we're hoping to be uh, back on board with with CDK uh, in the next day or two, uh, based on this recording, but. Um, we, you know, again, proud of what we've done. Um, I think it will give us some lessons as we go forward, as far as things that we might want to be considering or thinking about contingency plans. How, what if this were to occur again? All those types of thoughts. But right now, really, the, the, the emphasis is on getting back up to speed, serving the customers, and then there'll be time to look back and, and make more strategic decisions as far as, you know, what to do to go forward in a with without this type of you know mitigating this risk in, in a better way than we've done up to this point. Just when you think you've seen everything in the business, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, we thought <laughs> we talked, you know, there's COVID, who would have expected this? And then this thing comes out and it's just it's mind boggling, but yet maybe it's not. Maybe, you know, if we as we as we think about all the threats that are out there in cybersecurity and we hear that, we we observe different companies that are going through things, and there's still a little bit of, you know, I think within all of us, there's still a little bit of thought, well, that's too bad for them, but we're doing what we should be doing. And you have a key vendor that gets hit. 
and that that you know that brings everybody down and that's what we're experiencing especially in light of this outage how are you thinking about the risks and maybe best practices and and as as you just said contingency having backup plans that must get you to rethink all of that it does it it does and i again there will be a process that we will follow we've not yet gotten into that process where my executive team will meet will will probably speak to outside other peers within the industry what they may be thinking about but we we should not put ourselves in position to be able to be brought to our knees because something happens to a key vendor um as important as that vendor is, um, we have to be, there have to be better strategies for all of us. So I don't know what that means. I just know that having, having one, um, uh, you know, allegedly, right. Allegedly having, uh, one hack out there in the, in the, in the stratosphere, being able to do this to an industry, we've got to be better than that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the fact that so much uh, talk right now is circulating around the fact that, well, if it's not this vendor, then it's a different vendor next time. Yeah. And, maybe, and, 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 and how to protect the business model um, as a whole. Yeah. The business model, the customers, all the things that we're responsible for protecting. And in the end, Rob, it's just, it's the customer that matters anyway. Right. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So I, I think I think we've done a good job as as you know as good of a job as could 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 have been imagined based on where things were last Thursday, um, but it's still an inconvenience for our customers and it's still a lot of it's still a lot of heartburn for our team members uh, dealing with things that came you know came out of left field. I heard an analogy yesterday. Somebody said. Well, if a customer goes to a restaurant and orders a meal and they go to pay and they can't pay because the cash register is broken, that's not the problem that the customer has. It's that's the problem of the system. Correct. Fair, right? Very fair. Yeah. Very fair. What are you seeing in the marketplace right now? Uh, interest rates, how are they affecting consumers? Where's where is demand? Um, and and maybe as it relates to interest rates, how is it affecting dealership expenses, particularly floor plan? Yeah, well, floor plans up certainly from where it was um, at the you know the, the same period last year. We we we've been pleased. We've been pleased with you know the first half of this year. Uh, volumes up, uh, both in the new new car segment, used car segment. Obviously, the the you know, the profitability, uh, you know, on the on the sale of the vehicles is is curtailed from what it had been in prior years. We, we expected that um, the the uh, service and parts business is quite strong. Our collision repair business is quite strong. So we're we're doing a good job from a from a model standpoint with all the touches that we have of our customers. Uh, we're able, you know, our our volume, as I said, the volume is up. Uh, I I would expect as we get into the second half of the year for the year over year increases, maybe to be maybe to be more challenging to to, to realize as significantly as we have in the first half. Uh, but we're still bullish. We're still bullish, and I'm still bullish on 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 the business and on the current state of the industry there's there's certainly some headwinds interest rates when they we know when they when interest rates go up it creates affordability challenges it, it heightens the affordability challenges that have occurred with the inflation that we we've, we've experienced uh, in in the economy and, 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 and vehicle prices so we're we're sensitive to that and I'm sensitive to that and I think the industry and the OEMs need to be sensitive to the to that segment of the market um, that is being challenged and that slice of the market that may be getting priced out uh, of being able to say I'm gonna I'm gonna go buy a new car or even a used car uh, I have to wait uh, so that's not a good thing and all, all of the technology that is being put in the cars, uh, a lot of a lot of times for safety reasons or even you know from for emissions electric vehicles and such we can't lose sight of the fact that there 
there are many, many people uh, that are out there that depend on transportation and, and reliable transportation, and they need to be able to afford it. So it is a factor. Um, it is a factor, but that factor notwithstanding, uh, we've been pleased with, uh, with what has occurred thus far in 2024. Cox economist Jonathan Smoke told me that he felt that higher rates um, generally are the biggest factor dragging the industry and maybe even the broader economy. The people are, customers are sitting on the sidelines um, maybe waiting for rates to fall. Do you, you're not seeing that? Well, we're, we're seeing, I mean, there's the, the demand has been tempered. So clearly the demand is tempered. It's not, it does not feel like it did last year. So we, mm -hmm. we acknowledge a tempering demand, but even, even with that, we've been reasonably pleased with the state of our business. Um, but, it, it, you know, to, to, to Jonathan's point, to your point, as rates go up, it, 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 it will have more people based on affordability saying, you know, this isn't this isn't the right time for me. And it's, I'm sure that's part of the part of the influence on fixed operations that we're, we're experiencing, uh, which is a good thing, um, you know, from from that from that perspective. Uh, so, yeah, it uh, the, the, the pricing and the payments need to be tempered to bring more of the market back. In our Presidio quarterly report, we've we've called this period that we're in right now, Rob, the great normalization, that we're normalizing everything kind of back to where it needed to be. And it's a transition and it's a transition from enormous highs and everything that you and I have um, gone through in this, you know, the post-COVID sort of world. Do you characterize it that way? Is it the great normalization? Here's what I would say. Uh, I, I actually do a I do a, a a plan every year for 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 our business advisors, and I, I spoke spoke to this uh, a few months ago. I do not know. I am not qualified to say what normal is, um, and I I think I think it is dangerous for anybody in this time frame to say, well, this is this is what normal is here. Here we've got all these factors coming at us: um, EVs, mandates. What that? What's that going to do? This affordability challenge. What that's going to do? Other technology going in the car, driving the cost of cars up. Uh, digital retailing. Wh where where that plays? All these factors uh, that are that are impacting our industry. So to to think that we'll just look backwards the, over the last 20 years and say, well, this is what normal is and it's just going to return to that. I have a hard time buying into that, buying into that logic. Uh, I, I, I'd rather because I think when you buy into that logic, you're more it's more likely that you're going to be caught flat footed. So I'd rather the message to our team is we need to be on our toes and we need to be ready to pivot. And whatever the customer, whatever, you know, however we can best serve the customer and at the same time create productivity and efficiency in our model, that's what we've got to be focused on. So normal, I don't know. I'll let you know. I'll let you know after we, we get there what feels normal or not. But right now, I don't know. <laughs> We'll, we'll have another conversation in a decade and figure out what normal yeah, is. Yeah, there, there you go. Yeah, but nonetheless, lots of disruption um, in the marketplace. You just you just highlighted three or four things. To, and the disruptive threats for dealerships in general um, are, are, all, are all that you just mentioned. So what's the long-term risk for the franchise model? Or in general, what are the disruptive risks for dealers? Yeah, well, I'd say from my standpoint, the 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 the, the medium term risk challenge question that I think about starts with EVs and the the uh, the EPA mandates and what that how that is going to play out. And there's a lot of thoughts all over the board on how that plays out. Um, but when you when you speak to you know, I think from 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 many dealer standpoints, they'll there's there are some that will be like, well, if the election goes a certain way, 
this is not going to be as big of an issue and I'm not that worried about it. I, I think that's, you know, I think that's overly optimistic to think that something like that is just going to mitigate um, much of what we've been talking about for the last three, four, five years. Yeah. Uh, so it, it t- to me, there's this customer trajectory. Um, there is a mandated trajectory. There is a gap, a significant gap particularly in certain parts of the country, like the ones that we, you know, that we do business in. And then there, there are these overlying obstacles like infrastructure and charging systems. Um, so it, it really is, is, is hard for me to see how we get there. I think the manufacturers, and I've been pretty vocal about this, they have to do a better job in a market by market scenario saying here is in order for us to hit our threshold, here is what we need from you in hometown USA. So that dealer can get their head around, okay, this is what my manufacturer, my OEM expects me to do. And then at that point, there's either a, okay, I'm aligned or this, you know, I don't see how we're going to do this. And then there needs to be follow-up discussion with creating alignment between manufacturer and dealer in this path. That hasn't occurred yet. Um, that really hasn't occurred yet. And it, it needs to occur as we, as we go forward. Otherwise, we could, you know, the complexity of this and the, the, the federal mandates, the, the California mandates, that, that, that are in you know a number a number of these ZEV states, the calculus that is going to be required, the complexity that is going to come into our system, uh, the inventory you know you know uh, so certain dealers in certain states are going to have ice inventory, certain dealers aren't going to be able to get the ice inventory. Uh, it just is, and then from a customer standpoint, who wants that? It, it, we're not creating a, We're not creating a system. Or we're 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 at risk with creating too much complexity in a system that is supposed to be customer friendly because of this this um, this combination of the government uh, trying to trying to impact a, a, a consumer a, a customer demand trajectory. So I'm that's a that's a concern. Uh, I think that's the biggest near medium term concern that the industry has and should be focused on. And at the same time, you're watching the pendulum swing back the other way, where many manufacturers are saying, well, uh, hang on, we're actually into plug in hybrids now. Well, they are. They, they many of them are uh, because that's where consumers, there's been more demand from a customer standpoint. So I applaud, I applaud them for doing that. Um, I think they need to do more of that. But they're going to it gets back to the government and what what is going to what is going to allow each of these OEMs to meet whatever the requirement is uh, of the government in 26 and 27 and 28 and how that formula matches up with what the customer is actually willing to do you're going to spend your time post election leaning in as hard as you possibly can to make sure that what you, the scenario that you just described does not happen? Well, I've been active. Certainly I've been active. Um, and NADA has been active. I have, I, you know, I, 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 I'm involved, um, from an NADA standpoint, I think we've been working hard on that. Um, so we, it, it, yeah, um, that from, from my personal standpoint, uh, it's, it, is the biggest issue the industry in the near term faces. So I'm going to be as active as I need to be. Yeah. Uh, a couple more things. Um, China, speaking of um, disruptive, uh, China vehicle makers, uh, opportunity or disruption with mm-hmm. new entrants choosing a franchise model, possibly? Well, there it's both. It's both uh, depending again, on how the pendulum swings. And um, as we see, I, you know, I've, I've seen various reports uh, of, of Chinese automakers and just, uh, you know, a few things that I observe. Um, many of the automakers, many of the legacy automakers uh, have 
have done partnerships with China in different parts of the world, in, in their home market in China, and in, so, in some cases in other in other areas. And so, um, how does that? You know, what does that mean for us in the U.S.? How is that going to play out? How does that play out, particularly as the requirement uh, for EVs get ramped up? And we know that the the, the Chinese, the Chinese scale, the, the, you know, their their scaling of EVs is several years ahead of us. Um, so I don't know the answer to that question, but it, it is a it as you term it a disruptor. Uh, over over the medium to long term, it clearly is a disruptive force, and uh, however that ends up playing out, will uh, for those of us that are you know are are have, are stakeholders in this industry, we have to be aware of that. We have to be we have to be watching that. And finally, uh, another <laughs> seems like this is all we're talking about, but disruption again on the AI side. Uh, and the potential for solving pain points in the dealership. Are you solving pain points? Do you think that there's a pathway to solve pain points using artificial intelligence? We're beginning. We're beginning to look at it. I mean, there's, 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 uh, and I'm no, I'm not a tech expert, uh, but I, there's, there's opportunities with artificial intelligence. With we're, we're doing diff- different things in the service service lane with appointment setting. Um, follow up of customers, th- those types of activities, uh, and I think you'll see you'll see AI continue to get smarter uh, and continue to play a larger role in in certain activities with that we've we've always you know that have that are have been necessary uh, as part of auto retail. And you, there's also opportunities in the administrative area, in the in the back house functions. So we are focused on it as a company. Um, I don't know how quickly it will go. I think it may, in some cases it may go uh, more rapidly than we would expect now. And I think in other cases, there may be things that we envision happening now that don't go as quickly. Uh, but it's a, it's a space that will help continue to evolve and reshape how retail, how retail occurs. And you're yeah, seeing it in other in other retail, right? Not just auto retail. You're seeing it in other areas, and you just you're watching. I, to me, I watch that, and I I wonder, hmm, how does that? How will that apply to what we do, if at all? Maybe it doesn't apply. Maybe it takes a little longer time to apply the self serve concept. What does what does that mean for us? So we just need to be thinking about it, observing it, and um, and asking asking questions as as far as what our customers will come to expect from us. Wonderful. Always great to catch up with you, Rob. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on what is a an ever changing and entertaining time in the automotive industry. Thank you so much. Pleasure, Jason. Thank you, Rob. Thanks again to my guest, Rob Cochran. And thanks for listening to Full Throttle. Come back to us later in the month for our next interview on this platform. Email me with suggestions, jstein at thepresidiogroup.com or go to the website, thepresidiogroup.com. Follow us as well on LinkedIn. And thanks for listening to the program. We'll see you next time.